Welcome, everyone. We're starting a couple minutes late, but I think we'll be fine for time. I want to thank all of you for coming today, for braving the bad air, for locating the, uh, the ballroom, not just any ballroom, but the executive ballroom. And uh, I, I think you're in for a real treat. Uh, my name is Bob Myers. I'll be the president of the General Anthropology Division for another 23 hours. And then uh, Kwame Harrison will take over. <clears throat> but I get the fun part here of uh, saying that we're in for a treat with Ruth Bahar. And I'm, I'm so excited, personally and professionally, to be able to uh, have Ruth here. Ruth's poignant personal stories of movement and change, of loss and recovery, of home and homelessness, and of connection and otherness have always been important, but they've never been more important than today. Absolutely important today. And to give uh, a formal introduction to Ruth, I'm going to call upon Chris Furlow, a former president of the General Anthropology Group. And so, Chris. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, everybody, for coming here today. Um, I'm never sure why, but I keep getting asked to introduce <coughs> distinguished lecturers, and it's always a nice thing because I get to go to dinner with them. So we had a wonderful dinner last night and a wonderful conversation. It's my pleasure to introduce the General Anthropology Division's 2018 Distinguished Lecturer, Ruth Bahar. GAD, as the General Anthropology Division is affectionately known, celebrates anthropology across the span of contemporary subfields, multidisciplinary inquiries, and publics. Cross-disciplinary engagement makes GAD a home in the AAA for those whose interests transgress disciplinary categorization. Professor Bahar's research, known for crossing and blurring borders of disciplines, genres, and identities, exemplifies the kind of cross-disciplinary work that GAD supports. Ruth Bahar is a Victor Haim Pereira, Collegiate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Michigan. Professor Bahar is the author of seven books and co-editor of three books, awarded a MacArthur Fellowship in 1988. She was born in Havana, Cuba, and raised in New York City. It's fitting that Professor Bahar should be the GAD Distinguished Lecturer this year, when the meeting themes are resistance, resilience, and adaptation as these are also themes that echo resoundingly throughout her work. Dr. Bahar's first book, The Presence of the Past in the Spanish Village, studies the resiliency and struggle of Spanish villagers who rely on their long-held traditions of social organization to survive through troubled times and represents perhaps the closest book to a standard ethnography in uh, Professor Bahar's revoir. However, even here, ethnographic interviews are blended with extensive use of family and community documents to create a rich social history. Resistance, resiliency, and struggle are again themes in Esperanza's story told in Translated Women, which interweaves the story of the Mexican street peddler Esperanza with Professor Bahar's own story in ways that were both controversial at the time and inspiring, ultimately, for a new generation of anthropologists. Here we cried with Esperanza and learned how our own biography and life experience can inform, inhabit, and indeed transform our anthropology. We also learned of Professor Bahar's rebellious feminist bent, like going to college despite familiar dis uh, dispersions. And this theme is carried forward in uh, <coughs> Professor Bahar's next edited volume of Women Writing Culture, co edited with Deborah Gordon. Uh, which has become definitely a classic text on women's literary contributions to anthropology. Women Writing Culture challenged the influential, though male-dominated, volume writing culture, edited by James Clifford and George Marcus, writing primarily within anthropology, but bringing in some people from outside of anthropology, and the critiques of white middle-class feminism presented in This Bridge Called My Back, edited by Sherry Moraga and Gloria Amsel Dua writing primarily in women's studies and literary criticism um, the decade before women writing culture came out. Dr. Bahar's next book, The Vulnerable Observer, Anthropology That Breaks Your Heart, Bridges Ethnography and Memoir, and offers a new theory and practice for humanistic anthropology. 
more open to lived anthropology and a personal voice. Professor Bahar next shifts to Cuba, an island called home, returning to Jewish Cuba, searches for the Jewish Cuban community she left behind when she emigrated to the United States, as does her documentary film, Adio Carita, Goodbye Dear Love, A Cuban Sephardic Journey, which traces and explores a Sephardic Jewish Cuban diaspora. Professor Bahar is the editor of the anthology Bridges to Cuba, uh, first published in 1995 with a 20th anniversary edition published in 2015, which connected Cuban writers from the island with writers in the Cuban diaspora. The impact of the Cuban diaspora is also confronted in the portable island, Cubans at Home in the World, um, which was co-edited with Lucia Suarez. Dr. Bahar's entanglement and engagement with her own identity continues in Traveling Heavy, a memoir in between journeys, and finally in a coming-of-age novel, Lucky Broken Girl, published in 2017 based on her own life experiences. Robert Nash notes that uh, Ruth Bahar almost died in a devastating car accident that took five lives. Because of that, all her work possesses an existential edge. She is keenly sensitive to her own and her subject's human pain and finitude. She knows firsthand how anthropology can break your heart because she is willing to allow it to come into her heart. When it does, it unearths her own buried memories of disappointment and suffering. She is a better anthropologist and scholar because of her vulnerability. I'd like to add, we're all better anthropologists for reading her studies and recognizing the innovative contribution she's made to anthropology over the years. So now please join me in welcoming ethnographer, memoirist, novelist, poet, and filmmaker, or we could just say anthropologist, <laughs> Ruth Bahar, uh, the 2018 General Anthropology Division's Distinguished Lecturer. Chris, that was an amazing introduction. I'm not sure I need to give my lecture. That's <laughs> first of all, thank you so much. I'm so incredibly honored and uh, want to thank the whole GAD team as well for inviting me this year. I'm really, really tremendously honored and glad to be here. So, when Bob Myers wrote to me last year, asking if I would deliver the GAD Distinguished Lecture, I was incredibly honored. And to be honest, I was also surprised. I've always seen myself as an outsider to anthropology, someone who found a niche in the margins of this expansive and generous discipline. I was allowed to cling to my personal, poetic, vulnerable approach to anthropology only because there were plenty of real anthropologists carrying out the serious theoretical, comparative, and politically committed work we were supposed to do. So I'm not sure if I'm here today because I'm no longer an outsider, or if it's precisely my condition as an outsider that might make my voice relevant at this moment when vulnerability seems to define everyday life. This is a time of acute awareness and distrust of outsiders. It is a vehemently anti-immigrant era, frightening in its hatred of those others who have gone in search of a home beyond the borders of the nations they come from. Deportation is a word that has become sadly commonplace in the United States. For those undocumented immigrants from Mexico and Central America, who live with the anxiety and fear of experiencing this expulsion in the flesh, theirs is a state of unspeakable terror beyond what most of us can comprehend. And they are the lucky ones. A yet more dire situation confronts immigrants <coughs> fleeing for their lives, trying to reach the border to seek asylum, and being greeted by hunger, thirst, and violence that bring them to the edge of death. Coming together in a migrant caravan offers the best chance of survival, but in a Trumpian universe, this represents an invasion that must be stopped with military force. It hurts to observe the dehumanization of people from the other America, 
the America that I too am from. What is unusual about my feelings is that I can't separate the heartbreak I feel about the plight of fellow Latin American immigrants from the heartbreak I feel about the rise of Nazi ideology and anti-Semitic violence. Being a Latina and a Jew defines my life and gives direction to my work, but never before has the confluence of these two identities, Latina and Jewish, felt as intense as it does now. The Jew was Europe's perennial outsider. Expulsion, which Jews experienced throughout their history in Europe, was an early form of deportation. It culminated in the industrialized extermination of the Holocaust. Tasting that hatred here in the United States after the slaughter of 11 Jews shot down while praying at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh has filled me with fear. But I feel an aching uncertainty about whether to speak as a Jew or retreat to what Virginia Dominguez called the Jewish closet in anthropology. Jewish anthropologists frequently choose not to address their identity, not to do research on Jewish subjects, preferring to focus on subjects that seem more pressing, less self-centered, subjects that won't put us in the awkward position of needing to apologize for the actions of other Jews. At the age of 21, when I entered graduate school, I was drawn to anthropology's incessant journeys and voluntary periods of exile, its constant movement between places, its desire to find magic and enchantment elsewhere, its wish to champion and preserve endangered languages and cultures, its commitment to supporting the struggles of those who suffer. Anthropology embodied a peculiar search for home that only made sense to those who were seduced by its promise, as I was. The promise wasn't that you would find home. No, it was quite the opposite. The promise was that you'd have unfettered permission to engage with the world in the manner that immigrants do, obsessively aware of fragility and impermanence and grateful for moments of connection. Anthropology's immigrant soul sprung from the imagination of two of its founding ethnographers, Franz Boas and Bronislaw Malinowski. Their uprootedness became the foundation for a scholarly practice. To live as an immigrant between homes, between languages, between cosmologies, made sense to me. It had been part of my lived experience since childhood that I could pursue this state of being as a profession shocked me, inspired me, scared me, and it still does today. My own first home, now we get to some slides, was in Cuba, an island where I and my brother and my parents were born. All four of my Jewish grandparents chanced to migrate to Cuba in the 1920s. Abuela, my, mater my paternal grandmother came from a small town near Istanbul. Her parents had arranged for her to sail to Havana and wed a wealthy Turkish Jew living there, but he grew impatient for her to arrive and married someone else. <laughs> An uncle in Havana took her in. To pass the time, she sang Sephardic love songs and played the oud, attracting the moody man who was to become my abuelo, my paternal grandfather. Abuelo, for his part, had left Turkey to escape inscription into Ataturk's army. He could have gone to any of a dozen towns in Latin America that were attracting Sephardic men in his situation, but he chose Havana. Baba, my maternal grandmother, fled impoverishment and anti-Semitism in Poland to join her father, the first in her family, to arrive in Cuba. She took it upon herself to work hard to help get her mother and six siblings out of Poland. Thanks to her efforts, they were spared an almost certain death in the Holocaust. Baba found a job in the general store of the shy man 
who would become my Sede, my maternal grandfather. Sede was from a logging town in Russia. After his father tumbled from his horse and broke his skull, his mother couldn't support him, so his older sister urged him to join her in Buenos Aires, where she had settled. She awaited him at the port, but he, for some reason, got on a boat to Havana. When he insisted he needed to get to Buenos Aires, they told him he had two choices, stay in Havana or go back to Russia. So he stayed took the first job he found working on the railroad, and my grandfather, and here's his railway ID card that he was always very proud of. He found a job working on the railroad, and I lost my chance to be born in Argentina, the land of the tango. He and his sister didn't meet again until they were both retired with grandchildren. By then, Seda had been an immigrant a second time, entering the United States as a person of unsettled nationality, a description many of us might identify with today. These stories about how my grandparents found their way to Cuba are enchanting, but there was a sad, racist history underpinning their immigration to the island. Like many European Jews, they wished to come to the United States, but the door was closed, starting at the end of the 19th century and reaching its peak in the 1920s. The rise of anti-immigrant ideology in the United States led to the passage of the Immigration Act of 1924, the same year the U.S. Border Patrol was established. This bill imposed a quota system based on the 1890 census that limited the number of immigrants entering from Southern and Eastern Europe, millions of whom had made their way to the United States at the end of the 19th century. This is the time when Boaz, a German Jew, arrived in 1887. The law was aimed at Jews and reflected growing anti-Semitism, but others, including Italians and Greeks, and the Japanese, through further legislation, were also targeted. In turn, desirable immigrants from Northern and Western Europe were encouraged to enter the US, while immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe were restricted to 9%. Northern and Western Europeans received 86% of the quota. Prescott Hall, who founded the Immigration Restriction League and was a believer in eugenics, defended the new law. Speaking from a white supremacist perspective that is being invoked today, he asked, do we want this country to be peopled by British, German, and Scandinavian stock, or by Slav, Latin, and Asiatic races, historically downtrodden, atavistic, and stagnant? This, the anti-immigrant cartoons of the era, I'll show you a couple here, vividly reveal the haunting similarity to the current wave of antipathy to immigrants seeking to come across the Mexico-US border. The fact that my grandparents were unwanted immigrants in the US led to my being born Jewish in Cuba. My grandparents made Cuba their America, building lives and families in Cuba because the America to the north was closed off to them. But they were only welcomed in Cuba Here's my parents' wedding. They were only welcomed in Cuba because at the time, the governing elite wanted to whiten the Cuban population, which had seen an increase in black citizens after the end of slavery. European immigrants, including Jews at that time, were viewed as an asset. And then, after the Cuban Revolution, when Fidel Castro came to power and moved the country toward communism, we became desirable immigrants arriving in the United States in the 60s. That's my grandmother there leaving Cuba. We had now acquired symbolic capital as refugees from communism. Catastrophic change was something I understood from a young age. From one day to another, we lost a country. Starting from nothing in the US meant we felt we were nothing. I remember the fear, be polite, be nice, or they'll send you back to Cuba. I grew up speaking Spanish at home, and maybe 
because lullabies were sung to me in Spanish. I longed to live in Spanish-speaking countries, to know the places that inspired the literature and culture I loved and the mysterious Sephardic heritage I knew little of back then. So that's uh, my parents and my brother and I arriving in New York. Shortly after we arrived from Cuba when I was 10, as was mentioned, we were in a terrible car accident in the city of New York, and I spent a year in bed in a body cast, here's a representation that an artist friend created. So I spent a year in a body cast, recovering from a severe leg injury, a traumatic event that I revisit in this novel, Lucky Broken Girl. And I think that had a huge impact on the whole story of my life. Forced to be immobile, I dreamed of movement, restlessness, I imagined myself one day as a woman without a country or a permanent address, a vagabond. But my father felt differently as I came of age. He thought a proper girl should wait at home until a man came to marry her. Here's a picture of us in Cuba. A girl didn't need an advanced education and shouldn't be traveling on her own. Abi didn't know how to say, mi niña, don't go away, we'll miss you. I applied to colleges secretly when letters arrived offering me scholarships. He was furious at me for daring to challenge his authority. I begged him to let me go and he'd use his favorite English expression to end my entreaties, case closed. I don't remember what TV program that was from, but that, that was a favorite. I'd escaped to the staircase that led up to our apartment in New York to read books. Night after night, I cried. My mother did too. She knew how much I wanted to study. It was the late 70s, and hopes and dreams of the feminist movement had crept into our household. I remember my father saying, Estás echando a perder a tu madre. I was ruining my mother by sharing my feminist ideas with her. Finally, he relented, and I went to college. My mother went to work as a secretary at NYU. And I tell you this story because my education came with a struggle. Leaving home was painful, and that may be why the search for home is at the center of my work. I wanted to be a writer and planned to study Spanish. Here's my mother in one of, one of our many kitchens in New York. I just love that wallpaper. Yeah. <laughs> I think she was making tamales. Um, I wanted to be a writer and planned to study Spanish and Latin American literature. Stumbling literally into the field of anthropology in my senior year of college, I was astonished to learn that a profession existed where you could spend stretches of time somewhere else. It was a profession that demanded you get out of the library and interact with real people in a real place and try to understand their lives. Naturally, my father thought I was squandering his immigrant sacrifices but I wanted anthropology's passport, and I fought for it. Having attained that passport, I've spent the last four decades moving back and forth between my life in the US and my life in the three countries that have been at the center of my anthropological journey, Spain, Mexico, and Cuba. In my book, Traveling Heavy, I observed, call me an anthropologist who specializes in homesickness. Homesickness emerged when anthropology took form at the turn of the 20th century. It was privileged white Euro-American men and a few women who traveled far and wide, bringing back dispatches from New Guinea, Africa, Alaska, and the jungles of South America, places that appeared then to be at the ends of the earth. The other had held on to ancient traditions and superstitions, and though mired in poverty, lived contentedly in a world of enchantment. In contrast, anthropologists and the society they represented had become modern and scientific. The enlightened condition of modernity ought to have guaranteed happiness and peace, but instead civilization had yielded discontents, barbarism, and war. The need to understand this paradox inspired the early anthropologists to go on far-flung journeys, leaving behind the cosmopolitan world they came from. They looked for magic while remaining complicit in the inequities of the colonial power structure. But from the earliest days, there were other voices, other genealogies, 
through which to think about the purpose of our profession. In an oppositional move, the African-American writer and anthropologist, Zora Neale Hurston, chose to work in her hometown in Eatonville, Florida. As she noted in 1935 in the introduction to her book, Meals and Men, Dr. Boaz asked me where I wanted to work, and I said, Florida. I'm going to tell you why I decided to go to my native village first. I didn't go back there so that the home folks could make admiration over me because I had gone up north to college and come back with a diploma in Chevrolet. I was just Lucy Hurston's daughter, Zora. I hurried back to Eatonville because I knew that the town was full of material and that I could get it without hurt, harm, or danger. At a time when anthropologists were expected to do research in far-flung places with exoticized strangers, Hurston carved out a method by which to work among people who knew her intimately. Many knew her since birth. Both an insider who was just Lucy Hurston's daughter, Zora, and an outsider who had gained New York sophistication, she couldn't imagine anyone in Eatonville as the other, and in the process created another way of speaking as an anthropologist that paved the way for personal and critical ethnography that challenged the distancing colonial gaze and put the path of return at the core of ethnographic work. When I was in graduate school, no one spoke of Zora Neale Hurston. Now we give prizes in her honor. And the AAA even created a button, which I'm wearing um, this year, honoring her. As a result of her legacy, anthropologists now go everywhere, to faraway places, as well as to places we call home, anxious to show respect for the individuals who let us enter into their lives, sometimes to the point of mimicry. An existential orphanhood propels us on these journeys. We embrace in-betweenness, unsure of our homesickness will strike upon departing or arriving. Either way, we are more aware than ever of the emotional attachments and political commitments that animate our journeys. Whether we travel near or far, how are we to understand what home means in an age of extreme and constant mobility? We live in an era in which over 244 million people are residing outside the country of their birth, an era in which more than a billion people travel for leisure each year. Immigrants on desperate journeys rub shoulders with tourists seeking adventure and enlightenment in places they deem exotic. While the tourist swoons over a ride in an old Chevy convertible in Havana, an immigrant child from Syria named Alan Kurdi drowns, drowns in the Mediterranean Sea. There is great irony in the way a few can travel and consume the world in luxury while masses of refugees yearn to be able to work to build a home where they can live in dignity and rest their heads at night and dream. We have witnessed the displacement and destruction caused by hurricanes, earthquakes, unstoppable wildfires. Homes flooded, burned to the ground, fallen to ruin, homes gone in the blink of an eye, in the blink of an eye. In this past year, thousands have lost every last possession in Houston, Mexico, Puerto Rico, and as we speak now, in Butte Camp County and Ventura. And then, I'm sorry if I'm sounding so sad, um, there is the homesickness, the internal exile, so many feel as webs of political lies and shroud American democracy. Even those who've never left home share in the unsettledness of the immigrant experience. Air travel, the media, and the web have brought human beings closer, making possible 
numerous intercultural encounters that would have been inconceivable in the past. If tragedy strikes anywhere, we learn about it instantly. Our capacity to feel compassion for another's suffering is put to the test each and every day in a way that earlier generations never knew. Much of the horror in the world that we experience comes to us in a virtual format. We are exquisite spectators watching human sorrows unfold on a screen. When we tire of it all, we can power off. The fact that we can power off is both terrible and good. We'd go crazy if we didn't power off and enjoy life, but it is also possible to be driven crazy by thinking about all the horror in the world that we're doing nothing about. It is overwhelming to know so much about what is happening in the world and to recognize that we can do so little. I'd love to be able to say that anthropology offers a solution to our woes. It doesn't, of course, but our faith in journeys of displacement and homecoming can give us glimmers of hope in a dark time. Our work consists of slowly building an understanding of a couple of human beings at a time, slowly learning in detail the dilemmas those human beings face in sustaining their own humanity. From my years as a traveler, I know what other anthropologists know too. I need not fear being a stranger in a foreign land. There is kindness in the world, a message we need to keep repeating these days. In anthropology, I became the grown-up immigrant child who made homesickness a profession, the immigrant child who kept reliving the experience of displacement. That's how I ended up living in a small village in northern Spain, then in a town in northern Mexico, eventually finding my way to Cuba and coming to understand my family's sorrow about the island they've, they'd lost. Everywhere I went, I was treated with goodwill and generosity. I depended on the kindness of strangers. People would ask, what do you want from us here? I felt I had little to offer. I want to observe your lives. I, I want to listen to your stories. I remember Maria Rivero, who you see here, one of the first people I met in the Spanish village of Santa Maria del Monte del Condado, asking me, and, and um, if you die here, what should we do? <laughs> I didn't know what to say. I, I was 21. Wasn't I too young to die? <laughs> she replied, don't worry. If you die, we'll bury you here in our cemetery. Perfect. <laughs> I found myself, here I was at that age, I found myself in the company of aging farmers who had an intimate relationship to the earth. People raised rabbits, chickens, pigs, sheep, and cows, and stables that were within their houses. There was no telephone, and you went to the bathroom in the stable with the cows. Growing up in Queens, New York, I had never been in such close company to cows. Got to know them very well, and I knew their names. <laughs> I was taken in like a granddaughter, and as such, I was expected to help work the land. I learned how much it hurt your kidneys to pick potatoes. The summer months were occupied with gathering hay, harvesting wheat and rye, caring for vegetable gardens, picking pears, cherries, and apples, and ending with the grape harvest. Winters, besides being long or bitterly cold. You stayed in the kitchen most of the day because it was the only heated room. Franco had died in 1975, and Spain was trying to rise from the ashes of years of dictatorship. It was 1978 when I began my field work. A rural exodus had taken place before my arrival, and the children and grandchildren of the farmers I met had left the countryside to begin new lives in Madrid and other cities. The farmers felt abandoned. Out of nowhere, I appeared, asking for their stories, wanting to bear witness to their efforts to remain on the land at a moment when urbanization made it seem foolish and backward to grow your own food in little villages. 
It would take years for the organic food movement to emerge and for there to develop awareness about protecting the beauty of local spaces and customs. The villagers I met felt no pride. They were ashamed and humiliated to be working like brutes on the land, as they so often said of themselves. I was drawn to them and their rootedness, something I lacked and longed for, I who came from a lineage of uprooted ancestors. The villagers were devout Catholics, so I steeped myself in Catholic beliefs, rituals, and practices. The rosary was recited daily. Everyone went to mass on Sundays, except for the shepherd and an anti-clerical coal miner. I could have refused to participate, but that would have been disrespectful. I learned to recite the rosary in Spanish and kneel at the appropriate moments in the mass. I could still recite the rosary. I crossed myself during mass when everyone else did. The village documents I consulted for my research were church documents kept by the priest in his house. Every time I went to examine the documents, he offered me a glass of sweet wine. It's the wine from the mass, he'd say with a smile. <laughs> because I spoke Spanish and was from Cuba, people assumed I was Catholic. The pressure to conform to a Catholic social order was huge in, this, in those first years after Franco's death. I felt scared to tell people the truth. I wanted desperately to belong, to be part of the village, to be part of Spain. A crucifix hung over my bed. I took it down in the evening and put it back in its place in the morning. My paternal ancestors <laughs> 500 years ago had thought of Spain as a beloved homeland, but they had chosen exile rather than give up their Jewish identity and faith by converting to Catholicism. Why was I so cowardly? I acted like a conversa who kept her Jewishness secret. All I knew was that people had taken me in and come to love me. I couldn't bear the thought of losing that love. So I hid what began as an innocent effort to do as the natives did so I could enter into their world became an act heavy with the burden of Sephardic history. Fortunately, I was eventually able to come out of the Jewish closet in Spain as the country went through a collective soul-searching confronting the violence of its distant and recent past, offering citizenship now to Sephardic Jews, and unearthing the mass graves of those killed by fascist supporters of Franco, bringing the horror of their history into the open. For many years, I felt ashamed of my dis dissertation, which became my first book. I wrote about land tenure, inheritance, and communal agriculture, suppressing, it seemed to me, the literary aspirations I'd had when I went off to college. My professors approved it, but I was disappointed. And I often see that same despair among my graduate students when they finish their dissertations. Had I done justice <laughs> to the people I knew, there were so many more stories to tell, so many more nuances to describe, not still left to untangle. I just wanted to share this with you. So back at that time, before the internet, I would write letters, and then letters would come back to me from, uh, from Santa Maria, and then the mailman would write a little note right on the envelope, with, as you see there, Recuerdos del Cartero Amelio, just write his message, right on the envelope. Yeah. <laughs> Only in the last few years have I come to feel that my presence in Santa Maria had a useful purpose. Now in Spanish, the book has become a resource for the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the villagers that I knew 40 years ago, and for many others from that region of Spain. The pictures that I took, about 2,000, were scanned and are in the possession of the village and have become part of its intangible heritage. They have been posted on the website for the community created by Francisco Llamasares, the grandson of Maria Ribe. In true 21st century style, an ethnographic museum now exists in Leon that has placed in glass cases all the farm tools I once saw people work with, and they are archiving the pictures I took at a moment when no one thought it was worth photographing people at work on the land. 
The people of Santa Maria shared their lives with me and I gave them back the gift of a time now gone. On my most recent return to Santa Maria in May of this year with my husband David, we spent most of our time with Francisco Yamazares, who has become not simply the village's webmaster, but the village's most enthusiastic ethnographer. After a day in the village with his family and various neighbors, we went to the city of Leon for tapas and dinner. While having drinks at a bar, a young man came in. Francisco introduced Tonio as being from Santa Maria, a grandson of Amparo, who I knew from the village. I didn't know Tonio. He'd grown up in Madrid and taken there by his parents, who were part of the rural exodus to the cities. He'd married and had a child and become a chef. He wanted a change and had come to live in Leon with his family. He planned to renovate his grandmother's house and move to the village. I was intrigued by this idea of reverse migration and we settled into a lively conversation. I then asked Francisco Antonio if I could photograph them, as you see here. And it was only then that I took a closer look at Antonio's tattoos. On his right arm, he had tattooed the chef, but on his left arm, <laughs> he, oh, on his left arm, I saw an image that was eerily familiar. As he held up his left arm and then showed me the photograph that the tattoo had been <laughs> modeled on, I realized why the photograph was familiar. I had taken it. <laughs> The photograph was from 1984. When I used to take pictures with a square format Roly, which I preferred because I could look down into the camera's viewfinder and then look up and see the person I was photographing. I always enlarged the pictures I took and gave them to the people I photographed. Little did I know that one of these photographs would end up etched into the flesh of a grandson who had grown up in the city far from the rural life of a grandmother that I came to know through my field work. Tonio, let's look at him again. Tonio was searching for home just as I was through my anthropology. I had not expected my work to serve as a map back to an abandoned ancestral home that had acquired new meaning for a new generation. Ethnography had created unexpected possibilities and connections, a bond I couldn't have foreseen and for which I feel grateful. In Mexico, I spent many years in the 80s and 90s living in a small town in San Luis Potosí, where I crossed paths with a street peddler named Esperanza Hernández. She was outspoken, and I found her intimidating, never expecting I'd get to know her very well, but she convinced me she had the most interesting life story of any woman in the town, challenging me to write a book big enough to encompass everything she had experienced. Hunger, poverty, neglect, parental violence, domestic violence, the death of her babies from consuming the rage that poisoned her breast milk, and being named a witch by her neighbors, but also how she found strength by appealing to the spirit of Pancho Villa and found redemption by recognizing that her life was a story worth telling. Translated Woman, the book I wrote, was where I began to be a vulnerable observer, asking questions about how her story traveled across the border and what it meant that she had chosen to tell her story to me. And I think about this having done a village study first and then went on to focus on just one person and thinking of that um, Spanish expression, which is so beautiful, cada cabeza es un mundo, right? Each head, each, each person is, is an entire world. And Esperanza never let me forget that I could cross the border easily while she could not. I traveled heavy with the awareness that my family had attained a fast track to citizenship in the US because we were Cubans with symbolic capital. As a result, I, an immigrant child, had gained the extraordinary mobility of being able to travel wherever I pleased. Esperanza opened my eyes to the open wound of the US-Mexico border. She couldn't read or write, but she was a talented oral storyteller. 
I found her mesmerizing to listen to. I learned from her how to tell a good story. Her rage, her reverence, her criticism of the society in which she lived taught me to be braver, a touch more fearless. In opening herself to me, she helped me find the voice to do the writing I had been longing to do, honest, poetic, political, and personal. I was fortunate to be able to say farewell to Esperanza before her death in October 2014. Although initially she feared the gossip of her neighbors, she finally spoke with pride about her story being enshrined in the book. Her youngest son, who took care of her as she was dying, showed me how he kept the Spanish edition of the book wrapped in layers of plastic to protect it from getting dusty. Then the book was tucked away on a shelf deep inside a cabinet in the room that houses her altar, protected by the version of Guadalupe's serene gaze. He treated the book like a jewel. I was hugely grateful for that respect. But the book was something more humble and more precious, a souvenir of a time when two women, two strangers, dared to embark on a conversation with each other. One was an anthropologist with a degree and a pen, but voiceless. The other, a street peddler with a voice that would not be silenced. Together, as a century ended, our paths crossed with a serendipity I could not have planned for, and we became co-mothers of a book. I used to spend hours looking at the old black and white photographs my mother and grandmothers were able to salvage in the midst of our hurried departure at the beginning of the Cuban Revolution. And this is a, was a black and white picture that was colored in by Rolando Stavis. It was those pictures that gave me my first vision of Cuba, and that's me standing in front of the Jewish Community Center in Havana. When I was growing up, the laws of both my home country and my adopted country forbid me to return to my childhood home. As the years passed and it became obvious that we wouldn't be returning to live in Cuba, the old photographs became proof that we once had a home on the island. Being Cuban-born and the child of exiles, the decision to return was wrenching. It required fortitude to turn my back on my family and not feel I was acting monstrously and choosing to visit the island they had left under duress. Carrying that guilt, I was afraid to take any joy in being in Cuba. Truth be told, I was terrified most of the time I was there. I had anxiety attacks, I had heart palpitations, I was dizzy, I cried, I had nightmares. Ghosts followed me as I walked the streets of Havana, trying to trace the footsteps of my parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents. Would I disappear into an alley and never be heard from again? But there were moments when I felt strangely safe, as if an angel were watching over me, and I'd say to myself, Nothing bad could happen to me here. This is where I was born. All I wanted at first was to stand in the places where I had stood as a child. As if I could somehow reclaim those places by inhabiting them again in my adult body. Poems were what I could write at first. It took years of visits before I could figure out how to be an anthropologist in my native land. I wandered into the synagogues out of curiosity to see what Jewish memories had survived amid years of revolution, and gradually a book, an island called Home, emerged. It took the form of a series of vignettes that explored moments of epiphany in my encounters with Jews on the island, in whose presence I felt there but for the grace of God go I. Working with the photographer Roberto Mayol, one of, one of his many wonderful pictures, I documented how Jews in Cuba held on to material objects as markers of their Jewish identity. We were also looking for these conjunctures of Jewish and Cuban revolutionary history coming together visually, as, as we see in this picture with Che Guevara seeming to be in the synagogue. And so uh, people would hold up for my gaze those relics they had saved. Here was a photograph of the last King Sanyera celebrated at the Jewish Community Center in Havana in 1959, the year the revolution began. Here was the prayer shawl that belonged to a beloved grandfather from Turkey. And here, most surreal, 
a postcard sent from a concentration camp to a rural Cuban town. And then there was Daniel Eskenazi Maya, who expressed his Jewish identity in a different way through the tango, a form of music and dance, as well as a sensibility that was born in Argentina, more precisely in Buenos Aires. Thanks to Daniel Eskenazi Maya, I first heard the tango and fell in love with it in Cuba, my native land. Daniel lived in a rooftop apartment in Old Havana. His parents were Sephardic Jews from Turkey, but everybody in the building called him El Polaco, the Pole, which is the way Jews are often called in Cuba. He wasn't religious, but when he became a widower, he began to go to synagogue, in part to receive the care package they offered the impoverished elders. His thunderous voice rose above the others when intoning prayers and chants. That voice had been trained through years of being a tango singer. He had hundreds of 78s of the songs of Carlos Gardel, the great icon of Argentine tango. An informal shrine to Gardel, as you see behind him, who died young in a plane crash at the height of his international popularity, took up an entire wall of his apartment. Daniel spent his weekends singing tango songs at local cultural clubs in Havana. He sang every chance he got, not just when he was at the clubs. His neighbors, he said, thought he was a madman on the roof, always singing his tango songs. But he won himself an audience. He was one of the most photographed, filmed, and interviewed Jewish people on the island, where the minuscule group of a thousand have become an exotic tribe, like the Kung of the Kalahari Desert, observed and celebrated by tourists, anthropologists, and well-wishers. Just before his death, Danielle had heart surgery. He struggled to get used to a pacemaker while suffering from asthma. Unable to leave his bed, his rooftop home became a prison. He couldn't go down the stairs to reach the street. Neighbors competed to care for him, hoping to cart away his meager possessions once he died. To cheer him, I asked Danielle if he'd sing a tango. He smiled sadly and half sung, half whispered with words immortalized by his beloved Carlos Gardel. If there's anybody that could sing it, please do. Otherwise, I'll just say the words. Mi Buenos Aires querido, cuando yo te vuelva a ver no habrá más pena ni olvido. My beloved Buenos Aires, when I see you again, there will be no pain or forgetting. Danielle expressed passionately all the broken-hearted nostalgia of an immigrant, even though he had never been to Buenos Aires. In fact, he had never left Cuba. Meeting Danielle in the port city of Havana that gave shelter to my grandfather, who left Eastern Europe with the aim of joining his sister in Buenos Aires, helped me to love that other port city's music and dance. I love the tango's lyrics, which express an obsession with lost things, lost places, lost passions, and inconsolable goodbyes. I love the dance because it is a way to embody loss and time's inevitable passing, a way to embody farewells and the longing to return to moments fading to oblivion. For me, the tango is a metaphor for the anthropological journey with its twists and turns, its serendipity, <laughs> revelation of secrets, its refusal to accept the limitation of borders, its circle of arrivals and departures, its hopes for real communication between people, its shared mortality, and its nomadic search for home. We strive to express the fullness of what we experience when we take an anthropological journey, knowing what we write, can never encompass the fullness of the realities we have the privilege to enter into. As Isadora Duncan famously remarked, if I could tell you what it meant, there would be no point in dancing it. The anthropologist must go on the journey just as the dancer must dance. And I would dance a tango, but instead I'm going to give you a conclusion. <laughs> When I entered the field of anthropology four decades ago, I was struck by the hardy temperament of anthropologists. I heard that anthropologists usually had their appendix removed before going to do field work in remote regions of the world. You didn't want to die of appendicitis in the field. Of course, other things could go wrong. The, appendicitis was a, the appendix was a symbol. There were only so many precautions you could take. Anthropologists put themselves at risk. Such was their dedication. 
They were willing to dispose of an appendix to carry out the field work, not to mention enduring physical discomforts, illnesses like malaria, and other calamities. I wondered if I would ever fit in. I recognized I was the kind of woman who could drown in a glass of water. As my maternal grandmother used to say, looking down at female relatives and friends who were too delicate, easily depressed. Ah, ella se ahoga en un vaso de agua. Very bad. <laughs> so I'm basically out. Going into anthropology, I tried my best to toughen up, but I soon realized I needed to find another way, another path. I needed heart, I needed poetic words, I needed to drown in a glass of water. If I was to try to tell the story of the ethnographer's entanglement with a certain people in a certain place, in a certain moment in time, and how knowledge is produced in this messy, haunting, unrepeatable process. Why do ethnography if not to enter into, this, into, into the extraordinary fullness of people's lives? Why do ethnography if not because we are moved by the beauty and sorrow and fragility of human existence and by the gift that we have been there to witness it? Why do ethnography if not to create memory in a world that rushes toward erasure? Ethnographers continually enact, it seems to me, the kind of presence staged by Marina Abramovich in her performance, The Artist is Present. In this work, she sat at a table and invited strangers to sit across from her so they could gaze at each other for as long as they wished. She didn't move or speak. People stared, smiled, told her things, and sometimes wept. Her attention never wavered. She was present with each person. What I want to hold on to going into the future is this commitment to presence. The ethnographer is present. We might stay in touch with our interlocutors via Facebook, but our, our practice is still to be present. We sit across the table from other people for days, weeks, months, years, a lifetime, and listen and become witnesses to the lives of those who choose us to carry their stories. As an immigrant ethnographer, it is through this constant attempt at presence that I have searched for a sense of home. I know it's an endless search, an ever more indefinable search, as Pico Iyer put it, home now has less to do with a piece of soil than a piece of soul. If Iyer is right, then I have to say that my soul is in many places, many homes, and for this, I both blame and thank anthropology for giving me a passport that I hope hasn't yet expired. Thank you. expressing to you is our, our happiness of being present with you. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Will you take some questions? Or? Absolutely. Um, I was really intrigued with how you talked about Zora Neale Hurston. I've never heard you talk about her quite in that way. And I was thinking about um, whether you could offer us a little bit more, since she wasn't talked about during your training, um, kind of how you came into her work and, and any other kind of key influences that were not part of the canon you were taught when you came into that work and how it influenced you. And then the other part I was just really struck by was all of the, not just the evolution of your fieldwork in terms of thinking through how social media affects your work now, but also just the visual throughout your work. Um, because the taking of images and this sort of championing of film in all these different forms is so present and now having it in museums, having it tattooed on people. So just those two things, the kind of non-canonical influences and the way that the visual has affected your work, if we could speak a little more on that. Thank you, thank you. Well, this is... And thank you for the beautiful talk. Thank you. 
Well, everybody, this is Vanessa Diaz, <laughs> who I have the honor to say was one of my students, and she is an incredible anthropologist. So thank you for those questions, Vanessa. Um, so I'll start with Zora Neale Hurston, that was the, the first one. And um, yeah, I've been thinking about her work for many, many years. Um, I was not introduced to her when I was a graduate student. She was never mentioned at that time. And I found out about her actually when I started teaching at Michigan, and I taught a course called Women Writing Culture, which then became you know, uh, the book that I co-edited with Debbie Gordon. And so I, at that time, was just trying to figure out how to position myself in the history of anthropology as I was beginning to teach aspects of the history of anthropology to students. And I thought, well, what do I know about the history of anthropology? And of course, you know, I knew who the, the key male figures were, but I thought, where were the women? And, and I wondered if there were any women of color. You know, had there been any before? And I started reading, and, and this is around the time, shortly before that Alice Walker had written this amazing essay about going in search of Zora Neale Hurston's grave. And um, so I read that and started to read her work, and I was looking particularly for women writers who had been creative writers as well as anthropologists, because in writing culture, the famous lines in the introduction had indicated that there had been no women who were both creative writers and you know anthropologists. So I was looking, looking through history, and that's how I found Zora Neale Hurston through Alice Walker's essay, and then I started to do my own reading. And I was very attracted to her work because she worked in so many different genres, and I very much wanted to do the same thing. I wanted to be able to move between genres to write ethnography, folklore fiction, poetry, I was just very interested in, in learning about how I could write in different voices. Zora Neale Hurston also wrote these amazing opinion pieces, she wrote about race, and she did so many different things, and, um, and so I learned about her book at that time, and uh, her books at that time, and then that was also the time when I started learning about the work of Ella Deloria, um, who's also, um, there's an essay about her work also in women writing culture, so two, those two authors in particular were very important to me at that time is kind of looking for a genealogy. What was my intellectual genealogy within the history of anthropology and kind of trying to find, in a sense, you know, um, like literary mothers, <laughs> in a sense, so that I, I wouldn't feel that I was inventing something, but rather I was really resting, you know, on, on the work of other women who had come before but had not um, gotten a position within the academy, right? So she was not within the academy, so her work didn't get passed on, you know, within academic schools of thought. Um, and so that's why she, her work was was kind of reclaimed through literature, and then it took a while for for it to be reclaimed through anthropology. Um, so so all of that was very interesting to me, and just kind of taught me a lot about canons within that can, canons of scholarly literature within anthropology, and what's taught to us and what isn't, and how do we um, you know, create the history of anthropology and how we teach it. So our pedagogy is very important as well in terms of what we pass on to students. Um, but also, I think, as another lesson from this, um, that we are all also constantly learning. What we learn in graduate school is very important, but then it's also important for each of us to keep learning afterwards. And so I view this as kind of part of the learning that I did afterwards, kind of on my own, just, just through my own uh, reading. With regard to the other question, I've always been extremely interested in images. Um, I studied photography, actually, when I was in graduate school. I also studied photography uh, with Emma Gowan and Joel Meyerowitz, two amazing photographers who let me sit in on their classes while I was a grad student at Princeton. So I was really interested in photography. I'd also studied a bit of film. And, and I thought I was going to do more work in visual anthropology, I and mean, I still really love it. And, and now when I give these talks, it's sort of like creating this, this multimedia talk with the, you know, the photographs kind of support what I'm saying and the two come together. Um, so, I'm, so I'm really interested in, in that kind of work. And, um, and yeah, and, and now you know, with Leon having this ethnographic museum, it's, it's been really fascinating to collaborate with them and to give them some of my archive so that that work is now back you know, where it began. 
And, um, and we've been talking a lot at the GAD dinner and other conversations about serendipity in ethnography and what an important part it is of the work we do. I mean, we do all these things, but we really don't know eventually what's going to happen with the work we've done. We just do it, you know, in the best possible way, share it with the people that we worked with in the best possible way. And what's going to happen with it is, is completely unforeseen, and that's part of the beauty of it. And this experience, you know, this past May with Tonya was, I, I mean, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't have imagined that ever happening. It was just so, so astonishing and incredible. Um, so, so I think there's a lot of really exciting work happening now in multimodal uh, anthropology. I'm on a panel tomorrow, actually at two o'clock, about multimodal anthropology and um, the work that, that so many people are doing now, you know, bringing together the study of film and photographs and images and social media. Um, I think all of that is going to be crucially important for future work in anthropology. At the same time, I am extremely old-fashioned um, in regard to the fact that I do love words, and, and so I do think that being able to tell a story in words is still always going to be, for me at least, kind of my core thing, but, um, but, but the images are now part of that, if that makes sense. So, thank you. Thank, thank you so much for a wonderful, very inspiring uh, talk. Um, uh, my name is Claudia Ordonez, and uh, I'm myself an immigrant. Um, and because I came to this country when I was a young adult, I have always felt a little bit of a hybrid and, and inhabiting kind of this liminal, liminal space. Um, and um, because of that position, um, I think there is this, there is, a, is an advantageous, advantageous position sometimes to to think about power dynamics and in or can be this can be the opposite. Sometimes it can be an advantage or a disadvantage. So I was wondering if you have anything to say about that in terms of power uh, dynamics, in terms of the academia, in terms of also uh, being an ethnographer, being an anthropologist, and the work you do. Yeah, thank you. That's a really important and crucial question. Uh, power dynamics always enter into the work that we do. Um, it starts with the fact that we have the privilege to do the work in the first place, to do the research in the first place. That is a privilege and that is part of a power system. Um, you know, so, so we have to kind of start there. So, so power is kind of implicit in, in everything that we do. Um, and the power of mobility um, that we have, the mobility to come and go, <laughs> is, is a huge power. As we know, many do not have that, that ability to, to come and go as, as we do. So all of that is, is power. Our work is inserted and complicit with different kinds of power. Um, but at the same time, we try as much as we can to, to share the work that we do and to do it in a way that um, is as fair as possible and that is work that is supportive of the struggles of the people that we're studying and working with, um, and that in some way helps <laughs> to alleviate some of, some of the guilt that we feel um, because of the power that we have. Um, I think it's a very complex relationship in terms of the interpersonal dynamic in ethnography, um, because I've, I've always felt that, that we don't choose the people that we work with, but they choose us. Um, so people choose to talk to us as anthropologists and tell us. So, so I always feel that at the same time, as I'm very aware of my power, I'm also very aware of the agency of those who speak to me. And I know that people choose to speak to us for particular reasons of their own, as happened very clearly with Esperanza, where for her, telling me her story was very, very important for her own sense of self. Um, she would tell me her story with her children. Her two younger children would come with her when she would tell me her story. And part of it was to validate the story of her life. She really wanted me to hear it in their presence. And um, so there was a lot of validation going on in that. And in that sense, she was seeking a kind of power through me. And so, so the dynamic you know, is complex. I mean, I don't think that we go around oppressing People. I mean, I think it's, it's a complex dyna dynamic, and certainly at this stage of our history, as anthropologists, this is one of the things that we're most aware of, and many of us do feel work that is also part of our political commitments. Um, so we're often working side by side with people 
more and more ethnography is about doing shared work of various kinds. Um, when I was doing my ethnographic work in Santa Maria in the late 70s, it was such a different time from, from now where I talked to Francisco Yalazares, who's created a website, you know, with like, a, a, you know, as soon as something happens, he posts it, he shares that information. He's doing all of this amazing ethnographic work. And if I were now starting, to do new work in the village, it would be very, very different because of these very, very different dynamics that exist. And part of it has to do with the existence of social media. Part of it has to do with the existence of the representational forms, you know, having camera phones and all this so that people can be representing themselves in a way that they couldn't, you know, even, you know, 30 or 40 years ago when I started my work when having a camera was an unusual and expensive thing. So, so we're in a very, very different and I think very exciting time now um, where sharing power is more and more of a possibility, but, I, but our privilege is still nevertheless an important part of, 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 of our ability to do the work we do. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Sugan. Um, uh, thank you for giving the metaphor of anthropology's fast food. I think it just, it speaks uh, to me personally. Um, when you were describing your um, visit to Cuba and how you felt emotionally, psychologically walking through those lanes, I was thinking of something that I want to do, I haven't been able to, which is um, that my parents, my grandparents come from um, this territory which is conflicted between India and Pakistan. So, uh, so it's, it's technically called Azad Kashmir. Uh, it's ruled by Pakistan government, but it's fighting for its own freedom. And I want to go there because there are no pictures. Uh, there are no documents. All I have are stories from my grandparents who are um, really old, <laughs> very close to not being with us for very long now. So I was wondering that, um, what would you advise to somebody who aspires to be in that place, who aspires to write from that place, but has no tangible proof of it, um, has a very embodied experience of it, and to not make it, I don't want to romanticize or fetishize it, I don't want, like, there's a very thin boundary that I feel I'm treading and I don't know how to balance it. Um, and that is also home that I may probably not get to see because it's hard to get a visa to go there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the borderlands will always be in my way. Uh, but I do want to bring it in my right. I don't know how. Oh, oh so. such a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so beautiful. Well, I think there's many ways. And I mean, what I often say to people is, you don't have to wait to start writing. What you just said, you can write that down. I mean, you know, you can start, so you, so you don't have, like, you know, field work is, we tend to create a frame and it's like, this is when we're going to start our field work and that's when we're going to start writing. But, but really, your, your writing can start at any time. So you could start by keeping a notebook and writing down memories and just writing down what you know. And you could also write down what you wish you knew. So you could, you could do that. And anything that you have, any material that you have. So ethnographers create their own archives. That's what's so interesting about the work that we do. Historians will go to archives and do research, and I've done that too. But we also create our archive. We find the materials that we need to tell the story, whether it's letters, photographs, bits and pieces of paper, um, souvenirs of a place. So, so whatever you have that invokes that place for you, maybe start creating that archive. Um, if it's letters, if it's photographs, whatever you have, if, if you don't have any of that, then your memories, the stories you've heard, um, any way that you can be in touch with your grandparents from afar, if that's possible, through Skype, or if that's possible, or through letters, um, whatever you can do. I've, I've just finished a manuscript. I don't know if it's going to be published, but I did just finish a draft. I'm very superstitious, so let me not avoid a few times here. But it, it's, a, it's a manuscript, and it's all in the form of letters. It's all just letters, um, and I just decided to use that form because I think the letter, thinking of the letter before the advent of email and the internet, so how immigrants would write letters to each other from one country to another, and so I decided to write a book in the form of letters. 
um, and, I, and I read lots of um, collections of letters, because you can find collections of letters by immigrants from the turn of the century. So I read those to kind of see the form. And so this whole manuscript is in the form of letters. So you could conceivably just to take that idea is maybe write a series of letters to your grandparents or to others or to the politicians who created that division between people. I mean, you could write a series of letters or just find a way to tell a story. Um, and, and the thing is, is to find a form that feels so comfortable to you that you're not afraid. Because the, the toughest thing about writing is fear. When we start, it's like the blank screen. It's like, what am I going to say? Nothing's going to be good enough. There are all these other amazing writers out there. What could I possibly say, right? So, so we're afraid. So you have to get past the fear. And one way to do that is to find a format that feels relaxed and natural to you, as if, as if just like her, as if, as if you're in the, you know, in the kitchen talking to a friend about what you're going to do tomorrow. Finding that kitchen table voice finding that voice or that form where you could just begin to tell the story. So, so I think you could begin there, and then if it becomes possible for you to go to the actual place and get a visa there with all the, all the political complications that exist, exist, but maybe you can go there, maybe you could go near there, or maybe you could talk to immigrants from that part of the world and you know construct the story that way. So there are many ways to do it, but I really want to urge you not to wait. And to start now, what, what you just said was very powerful, and you can just start by putting that down in a notebook and just seeing where it takes you. Thank you. Thank you for a, a wonderful, inspiring talk. Um, my question is, I've always thought about you as an anthropologist, but I can certainly feel and understand how you see yourself as an outsider and on the fringes, or have thought about that. I'd just be interested in hearing some of your thoughts about um, when you were coming of age, what that kind of meant to be working on the fringes, and today, people who may feel that they don't quite fit into anthropology and how we um, negotiate those spaces either on the fringes or interdisciplinarity, and just your thoughts about today versus other times. Yeah, thank you. Well, one of the things that's been very exciting to me at, at Michigan, and some of my students are here, and thank you so much for being here, um, is that students want something else now out of anthropology, and I think out of academic work in general. And um, so I'm very excited about the next generation. And, um, you know, I think when I was on the fringe or thought of myself, as being on the fringe. It was because I was interested in doing work that was more personal, where I could use the personal voice rather than the third person voice, which now I think we all take for granted. But in the 70s and 80s, it was still very common for anthropology to use the third person voice. So even just moving to first person and saying, this happened to me, or, or blending a story of my own education with the story of a street peddler in the same book, you know, that was in the early 90s, that seemed very provocative to people at that time. And I was very scared myself of what I was doing. Um, and I wasn't sure, I was not always sure if what I did would be acceptable within anthropology. I always had this image that I would sort of be kicked out of the profession, <laughs> excommunicated or something. Um, so, so I was kind of scared because I was doing things, but I felt that I had to find a place in this discipline where I would feel comfortable, where I would feel honest with the kind of, kind of work I wanted to do. So, so, I, so I pushed you know, against certain sorts of orders that existed at the time. Um, and I wasn't the only one. Obviously, we have a whole Society for Humanistic Anthropology, and you know, many people who are interested in literary, poetic, personal approaches to anthropology. So, so there were several people kind of pushing in this direction. And I think now that is an accepted part of anthropology, because anthropology, as I said, is such a large and generous discipline, there's so many ways to do anthropology, and I was lucky, I think, to have ended up at Michigan, where there's um, such a variety of different approaches to anthropology, from the most quote-unquote scientific perspectives to like the most poetic and literary, right? So we've got the whole continuum, and, and I really like that. I like the fact that there's a, a continuum and different ways to position yourself along that continuum between the sciences and the humanities, right, which is what anthropology is. So, 
So I was pushing against certain borders at, at the time when I was young, that, that now those borders, in a sense, are much more malleable and, and fluid, I think, than they were you know, 30 um, years ago. So I think the new generation now, um, these people that I get to know in Michigan, are very interested in finding ways to combine the arts with anthropology, whether it's filmmaking or working on media, um, or working um, through art and installation um, as well, exhibits, right? And so, so I'm very excited about that as kind of like another way, in a sense, to apply anthropology because I don't think applying anthropology is only about policy. I mean, I think policy is hugely important, but you can also apply anthropology at the arts, through theater, through performance. I mean, there's some exhibits. Um, my, my colleague Jason De Leon does a lot of this um, amazing work. He's an amazing writer, but he's also now been creating exhibits with the various things that he collects, uh, the objects, the material goods that he collects on the border, and those have become now um, exhibits that, that end up in conversation with artists who are doing similar kinds of work with material goods. Um, so I think those interfaces or those intersections are now a kind of very, very exciting new realm for anthropology to explore and I think this new generation is moving in that direction and also doing um, very, very politically committed work, um, accompanying you know, the people on the migrant caravan and you know, being with there with the people who are making this, this complex crossing. Um, moving crossing up to the border, and so different different ways of being present. I think again, um, and and I really want to encourage that work. I think it's it's like the exciting future for anthropology. Thank you. Thank you very much.